It's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. John Hwanka. Um, not many people have uh, walked the walk, walked the talk around uh, integration platforms like John has. And he's done it both locally and nationally. So people say, act you know, think global, act local. He, he's done both. He's both act, thought globally, he's acted locally, he's also acted at least nationally, if not globally. And what, and what do I mean by that? Um, he, when he was, I think, a master's student, he already proposed to uh, the CIO of the then merging Beth Israel Business System to actually merge their two EHRs by putting over it a layer of integration uh, using the web, which was early in the web world. And he actually pulled it up. And uh, as a result of that, he went on uh, to become CIO at Beth Israel Business and CIO at Harvard Medical School. He then went on in parallel. Most of the, this is in parallel, even though I described serially, to lead multiple harmonization, data harmonization efforts at a uh, national level. And that's, I should tell you, pretty much thankless work because almost whatever you propose, to find someone who thinks uh, you're an idiot because uh, basically you're offending their business model. And nonetheless, he persisted. And as a result, we have a number of harmonization efforts that have been successful, including here in Massachusetts, where, where we have a data exchange that's much more effective than most. I also want to point out that he took a fantastic uh, but outmoded a system. Uh, by the way, not any more outmoded than uh, working off of the same original uh, code base. But he took it and wrapped it in the web so that Beth Israel Deaconess is now, it should be declared an endangered species from the point of view of HIT, because they have a fantastic user love system that's homegrown. And so just recently I heard that uh, Vanderbilt fell down, so they no longer have their homegrown system. I think Columbia is about to fall down. And I can tell you that the system at Beth Israel is hyper-functional compared to any of these other systems. And it's a modern web-based, but underneath the hood is a system, and I, I want to make this point, that was architected in part by our late friend, Warner Slack. So Warner Slack, I urge you also to look at the DR on the stories about him, because in, 19, in the early 1960s, he was building real-time operating system health IT that was asking the patient to take a history and showing that the patient taking the history of abdominal pain was actually a better reporter than the, the doctor interviewing the patient. And so he and Howard Bleich were the architects of that older system, again, no more antiquated than Epic, that John then took and made perform and look like the modern system that it is. So I really want to give credit for John for both his uh, genuinely uh, national and worldwide vision for health IT, but also, and I think this is part of his uh, reason for success, paying enough attention to the details of technology and implementation that have been successful and delivered an extraordinary ex experience for the doctors at Beth Israel, whereas the rest of us are just dying from uh, the stress of having to use ignoble systems. So, John, thank you very much. So much. Wow. With that introduction, I, that's so intimidating. I mean, I've got Zach, and I've got Griffin, and I got Sean, and I got Ken. I mean, wow, this is going to be a tough crowd. Okay. Well, uh, so the thing you don't know about Warner's early work is one of his most successful computer patient interactions was asking your drinking history. So when a doctor says, "So, Diane, how much do you drink?" You say, "Oh, maybe one drink a week." When a computer asks, oh, about two or three a night. I, no, not you. But I mean, it was, yeah, it was fascinating that we actually are getting more robust data from patient computer interactions than human human interactions because of the judgment factor. 
Well, so as Zach said, I have spent the last 25 years or so working in policy and technology. Now, is anybody in the standards world? Because, you know, you describe my work in standards, you know, 15 years. I worked for the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and not so much in the current administration. And standards, which are necessary for ITB2 and Transmart, as you say, are more psychology than technology. We were charged with doing things like figuring out how many genders there are, right? And putting that in codification. Well, it turns out that's a devilishly challenging question because gender can be a fluid concept. And so we ended up coming up with is not categorical lists like you might find in I2B2 pull down, but actually characteristics. So if I were to ask you a series of questions which would be sufficient for me to treat you respectfully, it may not be categorical, canonical, or static. And, and so these are the sorts of things you get to do in the standards world. But what I wanted to talk about today were some of the challenges in the last couple of years that I faced. And Zach, it's not so much as a CIO or innovation guy or professor person, it's as a physician. It's as a son, a husband, uh, and a father. And how does I2B2 Transmart actually impact these real world use cases that we all have to deal with. And so you, you focus on cancer and like responders. So let me actually start off with a cancer case and show you how I2B2, I think, could be extraordinarily useful, even in the context of our cruddy existent EHRs. So my wife was diagnosed with stage 3A breast cancer in December of 2011. It was HER2 negative, ER positive, progesterone positive, She's Korean, and of course, if you look at all the protocols that we have at the Harvard Dana Farber Cancer Center and all these smart people around us, they're written for the average responder, right? They're not written for an Asian female with certain characteristics or care preferences and all the rest. So she was put on a protocol, I'll go through that protocol in a bit, and she's cured, and that's right. So after or radiation chemotherapy surgery. But as you may know, if you have breast cancer survivors in your family, so that it's a journey. The treatment, the initial treatment is just the beginning of the journey. And that typically for 10 years, you'll be, if you have estrogen positive cancer, on such things as aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen or other things. And by the way, these are all awful, awful drugs. Uh, they, give, they cause fatigue and muscle pain, and great, you survive and don't have recurrence, and that's really wonderful, but you don't necessarily have the verb you're used to. But my wife was most concerned about survival and non-recurrence, so she was dutiful and took all of her tamoxifen and got quarterly injections of depot lupron. Because if you have estrogen positive cancer, you want to suppress all the estrogen in the body. So imagine her shock when a few months ago, she gets a letter from her insurance company. And Harvard Pilgrim is her insurance company. It's a fine insurance company, one of the number one HMOs in the United States. Said, um, we're not going to pay for your depot Lupron any longer. Because Larry, one of our medical directors, who's a retired psychiatrist in New Hampshire, right? Insurance companies very often will take folks who are no longer practicing clinically and they will serve as medical directors, reviewed a paper from 1990 of a cohort of 13 Norwegian women and found that the dose of Depolupron should be 11 milligrams, not the 22 milligrams that your wife is taking and the Harvard part partners, Dana-Farber Cancer Center decided was the right dose. So we're not going to fund it any longer. So I did what Zach would have done, which is I called the CEO of the insurance company and said, I just, yeah, and I said, I've just written a New England Journal perspective piece called the total failure of care management and included a copy of your letter. Right, what you would have done, right? <laughs> And his response was, let's bring the team together and learn from our mistake. It was actually an amazing response. So I got the medical directors and everybody in a room, and we asked, asked some basic questions. 
Um, did you use I2B2? Did you look at a cohort of patients like my wife? Um, no. Did you review her protocol? Uh, no. Did you talk to any of her caregivers? Uh, no. Did you determine her care preferences? Um, no. And in fact, what they suggested was it's atypical in the United States for payers to have access to the rich data sets that we have in our EHRs or in I2B2. And so, of course, they make a lot of their decisions either based on antiquated, non specific literature or claims data. Now, I'm sure all of you work in this realm, so you know how just totally worthless claims data is. And so let's just, since you were talking about ICD-9 and 10 and Snowman and all the rest here, let's see if I can find an injury on me. Okay, it's kind of healed, but this is a turkey bite. Now, why do I have a turkey bite? Well, it turns out I run an animal sanctuary with 150 animals in Sherborne, Massachusetts. I have cows and horses and pigs and turkeys and all the rest. And sometimes the turkeys get a little feisty. So I showed this injury to uh, my primary care doc and said, how would you code that when you're going to bill Harvard Pilgrim? And he said, abrasion. You're not even going to say it's a you know, potential zoonosis because it's an animal-related bite. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to put animal bite in the love of species of animal. And so what you have in my Harvard Pilgrim record is this completely wrong administrative data, a claim that has absolutely, I mean, what if I develop some weird atypical mycobacterial infection? No one using any tool would be able to figure out the vector that got it there because the administrative coding data is so bad. So that being said, you know, how do we need to go forward with this? Well, imagine that. Harvard Pilgrim had the access to TransSmart I2B2 and could say, aha, uh -huh, this is a Boolean question, right? 55 year old Asian female with a certain, I mean, at least the diagnosis of her cancer in administrative data is probably right, but certainly the clinical data much more specific. And look at what it is that are the medications or the outcomes given to women like my wife before trying to make these arbitrary decisions. Now, this was, of course, the intent of my activity, but they immediately reversed all the decisions. My wife is fully funded for eternity on all the medication she'll ever get. But more importantly, they actually reversed the decision for all women, right? So that now they've agreed the decision about the dosing of Depo Lupron should be made by doctor treating the patient, the patient and the family, and they agreed that they would now begin to look at what it would take to bring evidence, to bring aggregate data into the insurance company approval process. And it's going to be a journey for them. I mean, you talk about antiquated EHRs. Uh, can you guess, uh, here, I'll pick on somebody else, Sean, what, what language are most payer computing systems written in in 2018? COBOL. COBOL. You see, it would have been moms if it was clinical hierarchical data, but this is billing financial data, COBOL. And so imagine building, I don't know, JavaScript object notation APIs using international standards to COBOL. It just, yeah, it, it's a little bit of a struggle. And so what we hope is either we deal with COBOL thing. Or you deal with what we have in the clinical realm. And that clinical realm would go something like this. We have Epic and Cerner and Meditech and Athena. And yes, Beth Israel Dickness, is the last self-built EHR in the United States. And they go out to an API while the clinician is writing the order. And the API says, aha, I've searched a million patients in I2B2. And the range of sanity choices are the following. And then our payers simply agree to gold card to say, we will authorize as long as the clinician does something in that range of sanity, it's okay. Now, obviously, if somebody comes in with co-pain and the physician wants to order a total body MRI, I'm okay with the payer saying maybe that's not the first intervention. But something as esoteric as chemotherapy or post-chemotherapy dosing, that requires a lot more experience 
from the community. As you say, it's the power of the people to inform clinician treatment. Now, he also talked about broken EHRs. I just have to tell this story about this particular process to tell you how broken our EHRs really are. It has nothing to do with gender specificity in general. But just for fun, I decided to elect electronically prescribe in our EHR, people loop on 22 milligrams per quarter, just to see what the e-prescribing network of the United States would do. Right? And so this is a variety of pharmacy benefit managers and sure scripts, successor products have all interface the EHR. Every EHR has this function. So I say, it's my wife, and here's her insurance information, and let's go ahead and do 22 milligrams. It says, tier one, fully approved formulary good to go. I'm like, wait a minute, you just denied her ongoing treatment, but the EHR says it's exactly the right thing to order. So I called the PBM, talked to Caremark, and said, well, why is, why is this approved? And they said, oh, that's the prostate cancer dose. And I said, well, the likelihood my wife has prostate cancer is very, very small. <laughs> so in fact, the tra transactional systems we're using today, Epic Cerner, Meditech, self belt whatever, don't even take into account you know, anatomic gender assignment at birth or <clears throat> the organs that you may even have when they are making decisions. And that is what I would call the opposite of precision medicine. And that's where we really are today and why I2B2 is so important. But I see this not just in this example for my wife, but I see this every day. And as Zach says, so I am now Harvard's International Healthcare Innovation Professor. What does that mean? I save IT throughout the world by accumulating frequent flyer miles. I think that's what it is. But I go country to country to country. And so our last month I've been in Israel and China and UK. Every society I go to has kind of decided that the EHR isn't where the innovation is going to live in the next couple of years. The EHR is kind of a dumb data collection container, and it's for regulatory compliance and billing more than anything else. Where the innovation is going to live is in the cloud-hosted services that are API accessible and in unique mobile apps, all of which sit around the electronics. I mean, Epic's a fine company, but do I really think that they're going to create that cool new highly usable tool that you're going to use to make the right decisions about your patients? No. Uh, but will they enable you to call that tool from inside Epic? Absolutely. And so every EHR vendor is starting to say, hmm, isn't it like the iPhone and apps? that our EHR will actually be more valuable if we allow these external services and apps to ride on our platform. <clears throat> and of course, the economics of this are still being worked out because some of the EHRs will say, just like the App Store would, for a 20% premium or for a click charge on the API, et cetera. But the trend is there that exactly as Zach was saying, API enable goodness in the cloud and plummet into the workflow of clinicians, not only providers, but also patients and payers. And their antiquated systems will then derive the benefit from all the work you're doing. But there are a few challenges that I'm sure Griff Weber probably already solved. Um, so but let me enumerate some of these challenges. In many countries, they do things like assign you a canonical identifier at birth. So, you know, I don't know, is that Switzerland, do you have a healthcare ID? Yeah, I mean, most countries do, but not in the United States. And again, yeah, don't want to make any political statements here, but for the next two years, seven months, nine days, and three hours, we are probably not going to get any national regulation around an identifier. So here's an interesting problem. If you were going to deliver this API-based precision medicine in the cloud or requires that you take data from multiple sources, integrate it, and run it against some kind of decision support service, how do you even know who the patient is? It's a problem. I mean, many of us in the room have spent years working on things like probabilistic statistical matching, and you really don't achieve more than 80% positive predictive value 
I mean, there's some, I guess, new techniques like, I don't know, Zach, was your first car a Volkswagen? Did you ever live in Newark, New Jersey? Was your mother named Jean? And, you know, the answers to those questions are referential matching on top of your demographics that would help us narrow who you are. And so that's a technique. Uh, but there are other things we probably will end up doing. Biometrics as an adjunct figure out who you are, what data is yours. Uh, or we're even starting to see the notion of patients being stewards of their own data. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But still, this matching of all of your data so that you can actually submit it to a decision support service is a big problem. And we also have problems in the US with even figuring out how to send data provider to provider because back in the meaningful use era, you know, anyone deal with the meaningful use regulations, you know, I, I you know, we, we wrote them, but only the good ones, right? It was the other people who wrote the bad ones, right? We told doctors, you have to share data, but we didn't give them things like a directory of where the doctors they want to exchange data with happened to be or how to reach them, or what their APIs were, et cetera. So it was like we told them to drive, but didn't give them any roads. So we probably need a national provider directory of electronic endpoints for data exchange so for that and then of course data governance i mean itv2 has wonderful data governance who can use what data for what purpose but in the united states with 50 different states we have 50 different data governance policies 50 different consent policies is anybody here from new hampshire okay so in the live free and die state now i know it's or die but the liquor stores are on the freeway so i don't know <laughs> You'd think that New Hampshire would have very simple regulatory controls around data exchange. And the answer is eh, no. It's because you know, the legislature only meets 90 days a year unless they make laws. Is, you know, and they only make, what is it, $20,000 a year or something like that. So it turns out that sending data from the New Hampshire locations of care to Massachusetts across a border and aggregating data, it's actually hard and restricted. And a lot of data can't exactly be aggregated because the state government is so distrusted by the people of New Hampshire, they don't want data aggregated, right? So, so, so those are all kinds of problems you're gonna have to run into as you build some of these systems. But we have to do it. And we have to do it because not only in the US is 17, 18% of GDP being consumed by healthcare, but we're seeing this problem. People are aging, fewer babies being born, we can't afford the healthcare system we built, so we must build these decision support systems. We must build data aggregations. Now, I don't know if anyone read through uh, yesterday's comments from Atul Balande on what's the new JP Morgan and virtual capital Amazon thing is going to do. But you know, he said you know, it has to combat waste, and a lot of the waste is what care are we delivering is just not appropriate, which is completely redundant wasteful care. And it's this notion of cloud-hosted decision supports with APIs and data exchange that I think will get us to right care, right patient, right setting. So this is very important. And as I said, it's not going to be government. In the era, we had a great era of government to get everybody using EHRs, but now it's really up to you guys. It's up to the private sector. It's up to research worldwide. And so your problems with these cloud-hosted APIs and decision support systems, help us deliver right care, right patient in an aging society at the right cost. I'm 56, and I'm sure some of you have actually, as you get into your 50s, discovered that you're now the care navigator for those who are older than you and those who are younger than you and your peers. So that means that I'm the care traffic controller for my mom, my wife, and my daughter. And I would ask you, do you guys feel like you have the right tools running on your phone right now to navigate multi-generational care, ensuring they got the right evidence-based care at the right time or the right decisions were made? And the answer is uh, no. You all have ports. Maybe you have five, five of them. You know, it's a PCP, a specialist, an urgent care, an ED, you know, and they're not sufficient. So we need new tools for the patients to be able to make these decisions and navigate our healthcare system. I, um, you'll love this, Zach, because I, I think I2B2 could have probably helped with this. And this is actually a real example that'll be anonymous enough that there won't be any privacy compromise. 
So I received a call from a friend of the family. This friend of the family says, oh my God, my daughter was just arrested, his daughter, not mine, right, in, in Bakersfield, California. Have you ever been to Bakersfield, California? Okay. Oh, God. Um, think Bill Rickett. Yeah, you know, so it's not, yeah, I mean, fine, fine place, uh, just not really very exciting. So she was found running naked through a Walmart parking lot at three in the morning and then assaulted a police officer and was taken to an emergency department. And do you know the emergency department did a tuck screen and found this 24-year-old girl had used cannabis. Yes. And we all know that when 24-year-olds use cannabis, the first thing they do is run naked through Walmart at 3 in the morning and attack police officers. Right? And so the emergency physician, in the total absence of evidence, on one tuck screen finding, discharged her. And discharged her to her brother, so I mean, she wasn't put back out on the street. And anyway, the police got the charges after. So the family asked me to help. I said, we got to get her to Boston. So first thing we did was put her on a jet blue flight. I actually had to talk to the pilot at one in the morning and reassure him that she would not disrupt the flight and cause it to be diverted. That was kind of strange. Um, she gets to Logan. We take her to the Beth Israel in his ED. We do an LP. She has 9,000 white cells. She has the most purulent meningitis anyone has ever seen. And so after you know, days of antibiotics and fluids recovery, I said, so what's this about the cannabis? And she said, well, I had this horrible headache. And after it got so bad, I just had to start self-medicating. Now, what if that emergency physician had I to be to, and would be able to say, you know, what's the likelihood that a 24-year-old with cannabis actually runs naked through a Walmart? I mean, that's a little bit difficult Boolean expression. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but my bet is, is I to be to would have said, it's never happened ever. Uh, you know, look for something else. And by the way, here's a list of the other things you might want to consider. Structural lesions, do a CT, you know, it's the usual sorts of things that were done. And that, I think, would really help across the country improve healthcare quality because we'll have much more standard approaches. I think we've seen as you standardize healthcare, healthcare quality goes up and costs go down. And I2B2 can really use the patients of the past to help inform the patients of the future based on their experience. Well, let me give you a couple of other quick examples. And this is again from family. And by the way, we all have signed HIPAA releases and waivers in the compliance office. So my medical record, my wife's cover, they're all public. Don't worry about it. So my wife says, gee, I've had a series of symptoms for the last two months. My heart rate has been 120 chronically, not acutely. I've had a, a weight loss of 20 pounds. My hair is brittle and my eyebrow hair is thin. Now, if you were to go to I2B2 and search on some of those characteristics, you'd immediately discover thyroiditis. So instead of I2B2, she used me. And I said, okay, thyroid. She texts her doctor and says, probably need some laboratory evaluation. Her doctor says, sure, there's a quest down the street. Free parking, go get your T3, T3, uh, T4, TSH. She does her T3, T4, five times normal, TSH is zero. Clear she has thyroid disease. Well, so, well, hyper thyroid. Hyper, hyper thyroid, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. tachycardia, weight loss, all of this. But, but he's an endocrinologist, so trust him. <laughs> I, I just learned my words. Uh, so the, she sees a, a, an endocrinologist who diagnoses her with brain disease, gives her a choice. Do you want ablation? Do you want surgery? Do you want methamazole? And of course, she asks the question, well, how do I choose? How do I know? What do other 55-year-old people with these symptoms do? And of course, she didn't have the benefit of the API that could answer the question, you know. Of a million patients served, 900,000 chose methamazole. Or so she chooses the med, takes it for a couple of weeks, and she's fine. And probably 
Really the only other thing to note about this example is she started on 10 milligrams, standard dose, but 10 milligrams just was wildly lucky. And today she's on 2.5 and fine. And so shouldn't she have been able to narrow a therapeutic window, not only make the decision of the therapy, but how much therapy using the examples of data? Six months ago, and Zach, you're not gonna believe this, but because you have know, a body mass index of 21, I eat rocks and steaks, I've been a vegan for 25 years, but I was diagnosed with primary hypertension. And it turns out you can't choose your parents. Yeah, so my father had hypertension, his father had hypertension, my mother had hypertension. But we had to figure out in me, what was the likely cause? And so it was not only some medical stuff, so look at creatinine, you know, just make sure that there wasn't anything medically going on, but then Internet of Things data. Now, does I could be to include patient-generated data, yeah, or, or telemetry from blood pressure cuffs or anything in the home? Yeah. And, and so this is so important because my clinician said, you know, being a CIO turns out to be just awful, right? I have 40,000 people who depend on me and one second of downtime means it's my problem and they get very angry and so he said you know maybe this is just because that cio role, or maybe because your boss is difficult or maybe you drink too much green tea so he actually wanted to ask not only the medical questions but look at the data about how my blood pressure varied over a 24-hour cycle to help make it and so we actually gathered that data and uh, we used the uh, health kit app uh, we used some Withings uh, Internet of Things connected Bluetooth low energy devices and then shared that data via APIs back to our self developed EHR. And he was able to see there was no relationship between my hypertension and activity. So, what did he do? He said, Oh, you have this history of an SVT. Occasionally, I get a high heart rate. We're going to put you on 15 milligrams of the toprolol. Now, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to admit they were on beta blockers. These are awful drugs, awful, awful, right? Because it's like having two negative espressos, uh, right? And so 50 milligrams, yeah, 50 milligrams of metoprolol, you don't want to get out of bed in the morning. And so again, shouldn't we have made a therapeutic decision based on evidence of people who had Internet of Things data, my body type, or whatever? And so we ended up over the course of three days titering it from 50 to 25 to 12 and a half. And so I'm now splitting pills every day. And it's fine. And so my mood is fine, my energy is fine, and my blood pressure is fine. So that's the sort of thing, again, we want to narrow therapeutic choices based on experience and others. And the last comment is I mentioned my wife is Korean. Now, when the clinical trials were done on Taxol, were they done? and stratified by race, ethnicity. No, they weren't. And so what we found in I2B2 uh, is that I looked at cohorts of breast cancer patients who were Asian and found that they, they tend to develop neuropathy when they were on Taxol. And that's the sort of thing, you know, just a bullying expression, and you can look at the diagnoses. And what we ended up doing with her is taking her Taxol dose by 50% and reducing it, and she achieved cure and remission, but no neuropathy. And so because our clinical trials, I mean, you can't do a clinical trial on every single cohort. So use I2B2 to inform a clinical trial of one. <laughs> and we agreed, you know, if she had recurrence or if it didn't work, it's fine. We might go back with a full recommended dose. But this seems to be a direction that we should do for her health. And she's an artist, so neuropathy could have been. So I mentioned this idea of apps and APIs, things that sit outside the EHR. And so these days, most of what we do at PIDMC is mobilely accessible. 80% of the work done by our doctors and nurses and patients is done on mobile devices. I mean, the idea of sitting in front of a big desktop is just not 2018. Um, and, and so for example, one of the things that our patients really like is the My ICU app, which is now available to every family member who has a patient in the ICU, and they can see a dashboard. What is the care plan today? What's the progress on the care plan? 
what are the possible outcomes, what communication preferences do you have, what end of life position, uh, life sustaining order treatments, all that stuff is all managed on dashboard. What it doesn't have, of course, is any decision support of other patients like this. And so I could imagine using I2B2 to come up with an Amazon-like, you know, of other families who had to face these decisions, here's what they did, or here's how the patient did. We've also, as you start to think of your patient-focused work, created this app that layers on top of HealthKit. We take your care plan, show you how you're doing on your care plan, ask you to give us feedback. Did you take your med today? Did you restrict your sodium today? Did you exercise today? And this is a set of rich data that I can imagine I2B2 would find really valuable because, yeah, we, we wrote you for Lasix, but you, had, you didn't take it. Um, you're, you know, your blood pressure's high, your weight went up 10 pounds over the weekend, and then we ask questions like, oh, are you short of breath? Yeah. Well, well it's these sorts of things that are clinical and you know, EHRs aren't providing today that as we get to more and more home-based care and telemedicine and telecare, I expect that you'll get much richer data sources for your patient focus. Well, I just wanted to cover two last concepts. And that would be, as you look at the Gartner hype curve, and I'm sure all of you have seen this, it goes to the peak of inflated expectations and then the trough of disillusionment and then the plateau of productivity. And then I would add one other thing for IT people, Sean, the mire of maintenance. <laughs> but be that as it may, you'll look at what's at the top. Deep learning, internet of things, and blockchain. Now, I don't know. Do you have a blockchain version of ITP2 coming up here? Oh, come on. <laughs> so let's quickly talk about that. Just because I imagine blockchain seems to be in every PowerPoint from every startup I've seen in the last few months. You probably all know this, but blockchain is just a decentralized infrastructure not operated by government or any corporation that effectively allows us to write once and never erase data. So you can imagine that clinical trials, well, there's some fraud in those. What if the FDA had a blockchain and you would just say, I'm gonna publish a hash of my notebook, not the data, but a hash of my digital notebook to a blockchain and actually prove that my notebook was not altered. Okay, maybe that's a good use case with your data integrity and auditing. Now, I really hate to use this next example because I'm a vegan, but let's explain hashing real quick. Uh, <laughs> the idea, of course, is it's a one-way mathematical transformation that cannot be reverse engineered or failed. And what do I mean by a one-way transformation? Would you agree I can turn a cow into corned beef hash, but it's really hard to turn corned beef hash? Wow. <laughs> so there you go. So that's my thought on blockchain. Data integrity and you know, proof. Machine learning, just a quick comment. Are you using machine learning techniques that I could be too impressed for? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so why is this important? I and mean, blockchain, I find a little more hype than stuff. Why is this so important? We're doing a, about a dozen production systems at NC today. They're using Google and Amazon and other tools to do things like predict OR time. So Zach's a young, healthy guy with no comorbidities. He needs his appendix out. How much OR time should we give you? Well, since 1850, we've given everyone two hours. Well, you actually only need 25 minutes. So we're using machine learning to tell us what OR times we should use. We've been able to reduce OR utilization 30% just by using these simple aggregate data models with machine learning. Or who needs an ICU bed? Or who is going to show up for their appointment or not? Or when should we discharge you? And then how do we figure out the path of care to get you discharged? So as I think of the next generation of ITB2 and trans smart work, informing clinical practice and process by using this rich data set that you've been able to collect will be increasingly. 
So I wanted to finish on time, but let me open it up for just a, a question or two and then turn it back to the next speaker. Questions? Thoughts? I've stopped. I'll ask the question. Okay, it's a complicated question, right? So do I think the Apples and the Googles and Amazons are going to offer us middleware services, analytic services, and what I'll call Lego blocks? Absolutely. In fact, they will provide the best Lego blocks out there because they have so much darn money to throw at these problems. However, do they have deep healthcare domain expertise? They don't, right? So I think our role, especially in academic medicine, is to leverage these Lego blocks from the external Silicon Valley world, apply them to the data that we have here at the I2B to show the use cases that work. And then once we figure them out, give them to a tool go on there and, you know, and disseminate it throughout the industry. I also wanted to comment that sometimes our work is more psychology than technology. And that is, I mean, you did this with IGB. How do you figure out how to reduce the fear of data sharing and the barriers to doing that? So what I've tried to do at BIDMC is to make it really easy to introduce new apps, APIs, and services through a very, very standard process that doesn't require us to relitigate every single time some new startup comes to you a process from end to end, because that takes months. And I imagine all of you are faced with this. Somebody says, I got a cool new app. And you say, oh God, it needs to go to security committee, CIO needs to review, has to go into a Gantt chart, needs to go, right? You can't do that. And so try to streamline your process. And if necessary, compartmentalize some of the stuff that you think may be a little bit risky into pilots. They're geographically constrained or departmentally constrained. But try fast, fail fast if need be, and that's the only way that we can remain agile. All right, and so I mean, we all, many of us don't know a tool, and a tool is, of course, a very thoughtful fellow, and he's written a lot about cost control, alternative models, and all the rest, but hasn't really focused that much on IT. So, I mean, my feeling on this is. I don't think you should choose a single vendor. And so I see the, I may be a little bit wacky here because I don't think Epic Everywhere for Everyone is probably the right solution. I believe that in a few years, there are actually going to be cloud hosted commodity tools that aren't the kind of CapEx and OpEx that we see in today's EHRs. So hopefully what a tool will do is focus on what are the building blocks necessary, what are the APIs necessary, and what's the plumbing that we should enable without choosing a single thing. And I'll tell you, I mean, it's, it's a little complicated because I'm doing a $5 billion merger now with the Leahy Clinic and the Beth Israel Deaconess, and Newman Baptist, and the Jakes Mount Auburn. But the approach I've chosen is not epic everywhere for everyone. In fact, we'll have a cloud of Epic, that's fine for Leahy. We'll have a cloud of Meditech for our smaller community hospitals, a cloud and self-built stuff. But then these APIs and cloud-hosted services and mobile apps that layer on top of them give patients and providers a similar experience regardless of the underlying transactional system. And they get the benefit. And I don't have to put in a billion or two. Yeah, so that's 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 the hope. That's where I and I had the greatest hope for Athena in building that disruptor. And you know, Athena's ran into a few challenges of late, uh, being acquired by a hedge fund. All the senior management has departed, but still, maybe we'll watch. Okay, we got a few more in the back, and then Dan, I, I know I've got to get you back on schedule. Yes. Oh, right. By useless, what I meant was clinical interpretation, but... Right. Yeah, so this is a brilliant question, and I'll answer it two ways. So what has Beth Israel Deaconess done? I'm an emergency physician. We have scribes, so we use data slaves. 
And the idea is these are usually young people who want to go into medicine and they actually use it as a great learning experience, a kind of internship. And we actually find that data integrity and quality is actually much better when you have a person whose purpose is to enter the data with great fidelity. So that, that's helped. The second is that in a value-based purchasing world, we're getting paid for quality and outcomes. So in effect, you get paid for the quality of your data. And so what we've had to do is when we get quality indicators at our account care organization, we actually do a tracer and we go back for, oh, here was the quality indicator, it's bad. Let's go see along the chain how the data got entered. And what we actually find is the clinician entered the smoking status in a note. And it's like, doc, if you do that, you're not gonna get paid. Oh, okay, I'll start using the checkbox. And it's that end-to-end -end loop closure on data quality for payments that has helped our data quality. I think last question, this gentleman here. Yeah, and so I will tell you that Beth Israel Deaconess some years ago had a compliance related issue and a fine associated with that compliance related issue and it actually wasn't malfeasance it was just accidental we didn't have enough oversight so what has happened since that event is we've put in so much oversight on the coding the benchmarking of the coding the, the worldwide comparisons to bar coding to others coding that if anything we're under coding and so i guess it was rama Emanuel who told us let no urgency go unused. So there's nothing like finding a violation or a public embarrassment to cause you to put in place the controls for Beth Well, thanks very much. You guys have a great conference.